The System Apocalypse. Short Story Anthology. Volume 1. With stories by Craig Hamilton, Alexis Keene, Ix Foen, R.K. Bilyeu, L.A. Matt, and Tao Wong. Narrated by Neil Helligers, Shimon Casey, Christian J. Gilliland, Derek Scholes, Ian Pringle, and Gary Bennett. Intermission 4 Glad to hear you continue to mess up your galactic expectations, Amelia said with a smile. But any ideas of what they're looking for, other than the exceptional? Individuals, humans, of concern. Galactics as well, especially those who have been hampered in their progression before their arrival. I have already found the notices about myself and my lord, Fear said. But as well, any major galactic incursions or takeovers. And what would you do with this information? It depends on the importance of that information, no? When Amelia continued to stare at him, Fear sighed. At the base level, we track and watch for such individuals. The bounty hunter might be of use in our own operations. His companion might be of interest if she continues to be around, at least on a political level. Others, like that creature, are of no more than a passing interest. On a galactic basis, it is not worth speaking of. Interesting. And if you'd found a human settlement who'd found a place with a galactic? Who change species, Amelia said. Like Tim and Carcross, Fear said. It would depend. Then tell me about this one. Amelia flicked a new video over. Rebel Within. Written by Ix Foen. Narrated by Derek Scholes. Milla Scorpion. I jumped behind a mass of cacti and activated subversive stealth as my companion, Sumei, hovered above my head. Her wings were spread to keep her aloft, even though she could just as easily float while curled into a ball. It's tracing your scent trail, Adrian. You've got about ten seconds before it comes over the ridge, Sumei sent. Our telepathic connection and her invisibility made it easy for her to spy while I stayed in hiding. My short brown hair and tan skin would once have been my only reasons to believe I might remain invisible. When the system arrived, I had given up my humanity to become a polymorph, able to change form and hide in plain sight. Now, my carefully reconstructed human appearance allowed me to fit in, and I was grateful for it. My best friend, Taesong, caught my eye and offered an encouraging thumbs up as he crouched behind a drop-off. He held his soul-bound swords ready to attack. As a level 21 twin blade defender, his job was to block the level 60 millisorpion on my tail, preventing it from hitting me as I lured it into our trap. The creature had been prowling the mountain above our remote boarding school's property for the last few days. We had decided to trap it on our own terms instead of waiting for it to surprise us. My mana ticked upward as I waited for the signal to run. It's here! Go! Sume swooped toward the path I'd already mapped during our practice run. I activated environmental barrier, and the concealing cacti collapsed around me, flattened by a surge of mana. My body absorbed the plant's fluids in a revitalizing rush as the residue bonded to my skin for an extra few points of protection. Using speed boost, I leaped across the deeply carved stream bed at the cliff base and clambered upward. Left! Stinger incoming! Sume sent. I dodged along a narrow crumbling ledge, and a burst of stones rattled against my armor as the tail struck beside me. Already running low, my mana drained rapidly, forcing me to release environmental barrier before the fibers could revert to shredding my skin. A cascade of thorns rattled toward the dry stream bed below. When I glanced down to check my progress, I realized the millisorpion had made it partway up the cliff behind me. Taesong balanced on its back, his sword slicing at the joints of its tail. Hoping to distract the creature, I leaned to spit my own venom into its face. It jolted back lost its grip, and skidded onto its side in the crevice below. I jumped to safety as Taesong sprang away, leaving the stinger dangling by a thread. He flung himself behind a massive boulder as Cher launched smite. A wave of light erupted from the earth beside me. On its own, the area effect spell wouldn't have caused much damage to the millisorpion, but the cliff was another matter. 
A pulse shuddered through the ledge beneath me as the surface almost seemed to liquefy, and the truck-sized rock at the top tilted precariously. Dust billowed over the scene as a series of loud snaps, followed by a deep rumble, filled the air. I scrambled to find an unaffected location as my perch cracked and shuddered. When the air cleared enough to see again, I gave a sigh of relief. The landslide had pinned the millescorpion in the crevice, so even the lower-level kids could safely participate in the kill. Its tail segment still swung violently free of the rubble, but Taesong was already in motion to continue his initial task as the others ran to back him up. Cher lit up. As a level 19 holy warrior, her armor of god skill coated her in literally shining mana armor, and she drew her radiant sword perk from storage. Her golden ponytail bounced as she jumped down the hillside to join the rest in bashing the writhing creature to death. I relaxed into my new role, keeping an eye out for anything that might be lured in by the battle while everyone was distracted. Sume curled her lizard-like tail around my neck, offering a running telepathic commentary on the fight below. I tuned her out for the most part, assuming our plan would continue to work. We had enough experience by now that I knew everyone fought well as a team, and it was rare to have a moment of privacy to consider my situation. I was beginning to feel more and more useless as everyone leveled. My morphed claws weren't strong enough to pierce the level 50 or higher monsters dominating the area. Frontline fighting wasn't my strong point anyway. I needed some kind of ranged weapon that would mesh well with my skills, and all the guns were taken. At least my class would never paint a glowing target on my back, but hiding wasn't of much help in a fight. Several of our party members cheered over gaining a level when the Millascorpion finally died. Distracted from my thoughts, I looked to see if anyone had poison debuffs for me to purge, but everyone was already regenerating, some with the help of Marcus's minor healing. Cher's armor faded, and she wiped goo from her hands onto her ragged jeans as she found a perch where she could rest and keep watch with the others. Somehow, she still managed to look like a model, even while covered in muck. Anything useful? I swung my legs over the edge of the cliff as Mr. Sanders activated his Use What You've Got skill to check for additional resources. He was our token teacher, sent along so the rest could imagine they were trying to keep us safe. Thankfully, he'd done a lot of hunting and hiking over the years, and happened to be one of the few adults who treated us like equals. His rich, dark skin was dripping with sweat, drawing muddy lines through the pale dust coating his shaved head and muscular torso. He'd have made a terrifying warrior, but everyone loved how his logista class skills gave him the ability to break a carcass down to the parts that would be most useful to our crafters. He gestured for me to climb down. Nothing we'd risk consuming since you poisoned it. Thanks for that, by the way. The damage over time was a big help. I shuddered. The thought of eating bugs is just nasty. You've never tasted crab, have you? He laughed and flicked through a screen, linking me in so Sume could review the options. We'll use some of the meat for a cockroach herd. There are also several useful crafting components and a new toxin for you. Sume might know if any of the rest could be worth more than our current stash. We won't unearth the whole corpse this time. I jumped from rock to rock back down the cliff, carefully avoiding the unstable area, then absorbed the venom sack with a touch. My dimensional lab would break it down and record its components later. Having a racial resistance and the ability to reproduce toxins meshed well with my toxic apothecary class, even though I could only secrete one toxin at a time. Sume became visible and, as usual, took a moment to preen, enjoying everyone's admiring glances. Sunlight skimmed her black scales and wings with a shimmering rainbow. She had plucked the daydream of having a wyvern companion from my mind when I'd chosen her as my first perk, and she decided the form suited her. Keep the pincers, she told Mr. Sanders. They're the most likely to be valuable. I'll need upgrades from a shop to be more accurate. She disappeared again, unable to maintain visibility for long. Mr. Sanders nodded respectfully toward where he'd last seen her, then turned to direct the others. Let's finish up and head back before the light fades. After wincing at the sight of Tay Song and a few of the others chopping into the creature, I hurried away. Ever since they'd learned I could secrete poison, I wasn't allowed to help with harvesting. I couldn't decide whether I felt grateful to avoid the disgusting task or excluded. Sume, 
I could just head along the highway to search for a shop on my own. I'm not much use here. Maybe I could create a better role for myself. You need to bring a group. Sume landed on my shoulders. I groaned in irritation. You'll need help to carry enough loot to purchase some of the school buildings and turn the property into a safe zone. If you bring along an administration class like Mr. Sanders, there's an additional discount, too. I could list even more reasons if you'd like. I shook my head, feeling even more inadequate. Leaning back against the cliff, I practiced chameleon skin, taking on the color and textures of the stone behind me. Merging into the landscape this way took a lot less mana than morphic disguise. But I sometimes wondered if I'd forget how to recreate my own face one of these days. Giving up my humanity had saved me in more ways than by simply making it easy to hide and run. Ironically, it was the end of the world that had given me hope. After my own parents called me a liar for asking for help after Coach Watson assaulted me, I had taken off for the national park behind the mountains. I'd spent multiple summers learning jungle survival skills from my Ayoreo friends. Based on those experiences, I'd planned to live off the land until the mission stopped looking. Then the system arrived and gifted me with both the supportive companion I'd always dreamed of and the power to protect myself. After surviving a hellish first day, I decided to fight my demons by returning to help protect my friends. I'd made it back to the school a few weeks after the system arrived. Ever since, I had been waiting for the chance to expose Watson, but the creep always found ways to make himself look good. He'd somehow ended up with the missionary class, which had tipped quite a few of the teachers toward believing that the system must somehow be a gift from God. Knowing the man's true nature, I couldn't help but worry about the abilities he must be using. Adrian? Taesong was staring in my general direction, obviously unable to see me in spite of his perception skill. Here! I dropped chameleon skin and grinned as his eyes focused on me. It didn't take long to refresh my human appearance these days, since I practiced so often. I assumed everyone had guessed that my suspiciously spotless black pants, boots, and shirt weren't real, but I hoped they assumed it was a system clothing perk. Better that than the truth of a crafted adaptation of fur and thickened skin that had taken two weeks to design and remember. We're heading back. You're covering the right. I nodded and moved to prowl alongside the party, keeping an eye out for danger as we hiked home, following the rambling animal trails between the thorn bushes and cacti covering the hillsides. Even before the system, many of the plants had been dangerous, seeming to jump forward to dig into our clothes and skin. Now that some had developed a truly conscious aggression, we had to keep an even closer eye on our surroundings. This time, we only encountered a giant chicken the size of a small car, which Mr. Sanders forbade me from touching for the sake of our food supply. At least standing watch resulted in repeatable quests, giving me XP for staying alert and warning of potential threats. Otherwise, I'd have started to worry about my leveling strategy. I needed to keep ahead of Watson. Fort Tin We eventually crossed the highway as the sun was setting. After making our way through a maze of traps, we reached what we now called Fort Tin. Located halfway between the cities of Cochabamba and Santa Cruz, our boarding school had offered safety, spiritual community, and education. Only the children of missionaries and a few others who had paid extra for the privilege of an English education were accepted. The only reason so many of us had survived was that a random system fort had selected the walled-in hilltop that had once been our basketball courts as a safe zone. As the first sentience to find the location, we claimed it. This included a storage building and a game room where we used to hold class parties. With no way to get system credits, we couldn't expand our safe zone or purchase upgrades to fort defenses and facilities, though our crafters did their best with the resources at hand. Even the newly salvaged rows of bunk beds under ramshackled tin shelters didn't offer enough space for everyone. We were grouped into shifts for everything from meals and shower runs to rest times, making privacy a rare treasure. From the middle grades on up, we all took turns at watch, though the hunting and defensive parties tended to fill in the gaps whenever we were inside the walls so the watchers could catch a break. I waved at the group of little kids near the food shelter as our party dispersed. 
They had a card game scattered across one of the tables, and I sighed in relief to count all seven still alive. Far too few of the kids had survived the first days before moving into the fort's brick-walled storage room, and the predators in our vicinity were only getting stronger. The ancient army truck that had been maintained by the school for decades rumbled up the narrow track toward the kitchen area. Its wooden bed bulged with yet another load of salvaged propane tanks, boxes of supplies, and a massive iron stove from the old dining hall. Everyone believed Chef Richards must be a true genius to have managed cooking for 63 people over an adobe fire pit, with only the puny game room snack stove for backup. I headed along the track between the shelters, knowing Rachel would be checking in with her brother at our watch post. A level 18 air mage, she'd been assigned to the party guarding the foraging team for the day. Taesong had promised to join us once he finished emptying his inventory into storage. Any news? Rachel was already in the tower, gazing out over the shadowed soccer field, now a torn-up graveyard. Nobody else wanted the post for that reason, so our little group had claimed the responsibility. This section of the wall came with more privacy than the rest. Rachel's younger brother had already loaned her his mana rifle, a much-appreciated perk he'd chosen to go with his sharpshooter class. I glanced down at the hammocks we'd hung between the support posts and saw John already asleep, his face pale with exhaustion. He'd been keeping watch on his own since dawn in spite of missing half his sleep schedule the night before. I found it ironic that the system counted him as an adult already. The teacher still refused to treat me as one, even though I'd turned 19 a week ago. According to Sume, the system used the local age of adulthood to calculate and the Quechua considered their children grown at fifteen. They're planning a joint river run tomorrow, I told Rachel as I clambered up the ladder and slumped in the corner. Both of the fighting parties desperately want to bathe, and the rain barrels by the kitchen are nearly empty again. But no plans to search for more survivors or find a shop? Rachel shook her head. I scrubbed my face, irritated by the gritty feel of the ever-present dust. Mr. Sanders hopes the adults will come to an agreement tonight. I know he wants to believe they'll send us out because we won't survive much longer without system resources. Still, even his perpetual optimism can't help but acknowledge that at least half of them still imagine God will rapture us all into heaven at any moment. Taesong scrambled up the ladder and yanked himself onto the platform with one arm, clutching a fabric bundle in his other hand. Chef sent along some snacks since we missed lunch and dinner. Cold meat as usual, but Doña Maria's new mud oven has dried enough to bake the first batch of maraquetas, and were her guinea pigs. Bread! We tore open the bundle and shared the still warm rolls, even waking John long enough to stuff his face with a treat. I breathed in the steam as I tore off a bite. For just a moment, I remembered how it felt to be safe and happy. Now all I need is a guarana. Rachel sighed. Too bad we finished the last of the soda weeks ago. I wrapped the remainder of my roll in its napkin and regretfully returned it to the pile of food. My old favorite still tasted just as good, even now that I wasn't human. Sume had mentioned this was a system effect, associating my new body's experiences to a memory matrix my mind could comprehend. Still, the necessary internal organs no longer existed. I'd have to reach at least master class to fully replicate a human body. For now, to fake the process of eating solids, I had to use minor morph and create a pocket in my torso for anything my body couldn't absorb. Most fluids were easy to integrate, but solids led to debuffs to my health whenever I had to store them until I could manually eject the residue. You're not going to eat any? Taesong shook his finger at me. Just because a polymorph can survive on fluids doesn't mean you're not allowed to enjoy a treat with the rest of us. Eat the bread, okay? Let's just enjoy it together. He shoved the roll back into my hand as I continued to hesitate. I promise we'll eat the meat without you. I had to laugh at his long-suffering tone as I reclaimed my portion. I might feel a little uncomfortable later on, but with each bite, I felt more human than I had since the system changed my body. Tay Song Brilliant and familiar, the stars gazed down at me as I stood watch. Among them existed alien cultures and a myriad of worlds, similar to my favorite books and daydreams. 
rolled in a blanket on the platform beside me. Taesong sobbed in the grip of a nightmare. He almost never slept in the shelters, saying he couldn't relax with everyone crowding together. I debated whether to wake him. These days, being awake wasn't much of a relief. He jumped and reached for my arm. Adrian, you still alive? Yes. With a sigh of relief, he pulled himself up to keep watch beside me. I had morphed my eyes to register the ultraviolet spectrum when night fell, and he had a night vision spell. Even without a moon, his skin glowed to my eyes, revealing his oval face and straight nose as he glared out at the field. It might be better to ignore the glimmering traces of tears on his cheeks for now. Together, we watched the mutated cockroaches feasting below. They'd attack any other creature attempting to sneak into their feeding grounds, giving us a chance to wake everyone up and get in position. I still can't believe we're using giant cockroaches as guards, he grumbled. Better them than us. True. He slumped against the wall and drew his swords. He'd once mentioned that holding them reminded him of the years he'd spent training with his father. You can sleep if you want. I'm going to be awake anyway, and it's only an hour or so till dawn. I won't need to hibernate for another two days. It felt like my words would create an impassable wall between us as I spoke. I'm too alien, aren't I? I wonder whether it's hard for everyone to be around me now. Hmm. Everyone changed. So what if your race is different? You're still you. His voice softened. I feel like you becoming a polymorph is a promise, in a way. That was unexpected. I turned to face him, wondering whether I should ask what he meant. Zume floated higher. Talk to him. I'll keep watch. Noticing my hesitation, Taesong shifted to face me. You mentioned you don't have a gender now, right? His narrow eyes seemed to pierce the darkness. Well, yes. It's part of being a polymorph. This felt dangerous, like I was standing on the edge of exposing my greatest flaw. Even if Taesong had always been more accepting of my oddities than anyone I'd ever met, I wasn't sure he'd accept this. He lowered his voice until even my enhanced hearing could scarcely pick up the words. It's like if the universe actually has whole races without gender affecting their relationships, maybe there's a place where I'd fit in too. But everyone loves you already. I couldn't understand how he could believe he didn't fit in when everyone had always admired him. That someone so popular chose to hang out with me had always felt like a rare error in judgment on his part. They'd reject me if they knew the truth. He curled in on himself, clutching his swords as if they were his lifeline. I'm not normal. I hesitated, unable to see his expression. His straight black hair had grown long enough to hide his face. It didn't seem that long ago that the teachers had the energy to enforce rules on acceptable hairstyles. There was a rush of motion below as the cockroaches encountered an invader. We tensed, but the creature was overtaken by the mob. I shivered. Without my toxins to call their numbers below the control limits of Abuelo's herder class, even these low-level swarms could wipe out the fort within days. The silence between Taesong and I grew heavier as I reviewed our conversation. Tell him your secret, and maybe he'll feel safe enough to tell you his. Sume sounded fed up with my hesitation. He's already accepted your physical changes. If you can't trust him now, then you might as well admit you think he's a liar for saying he values your friendship. Calling Taesong a liar grated on me as she knew it would. Ugh, fine. He jumped since I'd accidentally spoken out loud. Below us, the ropes of Rachel's hammocks creaked. Attack? I sighed. No, it's nothing. Sorry. Sume said something weird. Never mind. Okay, then. We listened as she settled back into sleep. Eventually, her breathing evened out as we stared over the wall. I don't want you to hate me. I leaned in, keeping my voice low. But can I tell you something I've never told anyone? Taesong nudged my arm with his elbow. I can't ever imagine hating you, Adrian. It's impossible. Uh, well, the genderless thing? I chose to change race because of it. Whatever it is everyone else seems to know that makes them one or the other, my body just 
It felt like puppet strings forcing me to be something I wasn't. I hated it. My voice trailed off and I dropped my forehead onto my hands where they rested on the wall. In spite of everything, it's such a relief to just be myself now. I can change the parts that bothered me before. After setting his sword across his knees, he flung his right arm over my shoulder and patted the back of my head as if I were a puppy. That's all? I thought you were going to tell me you killed someone or something. Not yet, I mumbled thinking of Watson. I hope I never have to either. He chuckled. It's strange to live in a world where that answer feels reassuring instead of creepy. Forget trying to say things right. I had to get things out there one way or another. I wanted you to know I trust you, in case you ever want to talk about your... thing. I can't imagine hating you either. Raptor A chilling shriek disrupted our conversation as a larger predator charged into the mass of cockroaches. The creature tore into them, clearly too powerful for them to take down. It looks like a velociraptor. I yanked on the cord strung over Fort Tin, attached to a small bell by Mr. Sanders' bed, alerting our party back in the shelters. This had better not turn out like Jurassic Park. Taesong leaned over the platform edge to wake Rachel and John. We'd had to move outside to fight it off since neither the maze nor the walls were enough to handle a direct assault from something this powerful. It's crushing the cockroaches. Too dangerous. I'm going to lure it the long way toward the northern pit trap. I morphed my fingers to increase adherence and began to climb down the wall. Be careful, Taesong leaned over the edge. We'll be ready. Cher's face appeared beside his, and I knew the rest of our party was close behind. Joaquim would wake and buff them with night vision, and they'd run to the trap the short way. The cockroaches gave up the fight and scuttled back into hiding as I reached the edge of the maze. I hoped I could be irritating enough to distract the raptor from the fort. Half an hour later... I flattened myself behind a ledge to flash minor morph and repair the most recent hole the raptor had nipped in my shoulder. All the running and hiding reminded me of the early days when I'd been on my own. I glanced at my stats, noting the usual warning notification. HP, 75 of 490. MP, 67 of 500. Warning, mass at 5% below optimal range. 6% debuff to health and stamina. Sume swooped up the gully toward her destination. Run! At least I had backup waiting. Even with speed boost for emergencies in my high endurance, the creature was far too close on my trail. Thankfully, its desire to make a meal of me blinded it to the party and hiding around the massive pit we'd dug a few days earlier. Dawn brightened the sky as I sprinted across a rigged slack line with the raptor nipping at my heels, the edges of my vision flashing with debuffs to health strength, and more from losing too much mass to its attacks. Its shriek of anger stunned everyone but me when the twig and dirt cover over the pit collapsed, dropping it six yards onto sharpened stakes. I had coated them with blood thinner to increase their damage. I spent an anxious ten seconds waiting while everyone recovered, trying to think of what I could do to help fight it off. The raptor scrabbled at the wall, creating pockets in the earth so it could pull itself off the stakes. Just before it reached the top, a series of stuns interspersed with rifle fire blasted it back down where Joe entangled it with a vine trap. Taesong and Mr. Sanders strained to swing a concrete platform into position, its base layered with jagged rebar spikes. The ramshackle tripod and police creaked until someone released the catch and the platform dropped into the hole with a crash. Even this still wasn't enough to kill the raging raptor, which continued to struggle, its convulsions powerful enough to crack the concrete. Cher started to chain smite every time it finished cooldown, hoping to drive the spikes in deeper before the lid crumbled completely. When it finally broke apart, the rebar remained embedded in the raptor's muscles, inhibiting its attempts to free itself. By the time the sun rose, everyone had a chance to get in on the battle while the creature nearly managed to escape the trap multiple times. We won in the end but various team members lost an arm, a few hands, and half a foot in the process, reducing our fighting force for the time needed to regrow their limbs. Combat healer Joaquim would have his work cut out for him when we got home. A quest update alerted me that I had received XP for warning of an invader before it breached our defenses, more for leading it away from Fort Tin 
and a bonus for participating in a winning battle against a monster more than 30 levels above my current party's average. I had finally reached level 21, but it still wouldn't be enough power to protect everyone. I couldn't help but wonder how much longer we could survive on too little sleep while fighting attackers like this. Sumei nodded in silent agreement with my thoughts as we watched Mr. Sanders climb down to settle for the basic loot. The body was too shredded and poisoned to retrieve much else. I helped poison it further, and we left the remains for scavengers before heading back to Fort Tin, hoping to arrive in time for breakfast. On the way back, a mutated bush snatched at us with its branches. Thankfully, its last meal had damaged it enough that the fight was over quickly. Absorbing its mana-rich remains boosted my mass enough to eliminate the worst debuffs.